We'll start with the prayers. Shanti Mantra. Om Apyayantu Mamangani Vat Pranas Chakshu Shotra Mato Balam Indriyani Chasarvani Sarvam Brahma Ponoshidam Maham Brahma Nirakuriyam Mama Brahma Nirakaro Nirakaranam astva nirakaranam me astu Tadatmani nirate ya upanishatu dharmasta mai santo te mai santo Om shanti 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 Today we are going to start a new Upanishadic study. This Upanishad is called as Keno Upanishad. We have finished study of Kaivalya Upanishad. That was our first study. Then we studied Mundak Upanishad. Our aim is to study 12 Upanishads. 10 Upanishads where Shankaracharya has written a commentary. And then two other Upanishads we will also study. Normally in all Vedantic schools, they take four or five Upanishads for study. And generally they study the Shankara Bhashyam, connected with these Upanishads. The primary Upanishads are Mundak Upanishad, Taitri Upanishad, Mandokya Upanishad, Keno Upanishad. These are all famous Upanishads, always studied by the students in all Vedantic schools. There are two Upanishads which are very, very large Upanishads, Pradhanyaka Upanishad and Chandogya Upanishad. These are very, very big voluminous Upanishads. Therefore, only a certain portion of that is taken up. We will also do that in our study. Why do we study Upanishads, Bhagavad Gita and Brahma Sutra. These are three texts which we normally study in order to understand Atma. There are four goals of for human beings, four Purusharthas. Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha. Dharma deals with leading a virtuous life, knowing what is right and what is wrong. Artha means pursuing wealth. Kama means pursuing entertainment. These three goals are very common. Most of us are aiming to achieve, accomplish these three goals. Very few of us who are exposed to the Anta portion, who are exposed to some amount of religious literature, which is called as the Veda, only those people are exposed to the fourth Purushartha. The fourth Purushartha is called as Moksha Purushartha. It is not a very common Purushartha. It is only pursued by students who are exposed to the Veda, Vedic culture. What do you mean by this Moksha Purushartha? See, why that we should definitely understand the goal of our study. 
If you understand the goal, then you will put effort behind the study. You will find the time necessary, which is required for the study. And then you get the result of the study, the palam, the fruit of the study, you will realize the benefit. Moksha means liberation, freedom. What is this freedom we are talking about? When we live in this world, we are identified with this body. And we are identified with our mind as our real self. This is a common na nature of all human beings. Instinctively, we are all identified with our body when we act. We are identified with the emotions in our mind and we take these emotions as real and it is the ultimate truth. Never do we realize that there could be something which I don't know about myself. It is these type of students who come to Veda and search for the truth or the reality behind this body-mind complex and the reality behind the whole universe. That study which deals with the reality behind this body and mind and behind the entire universe is called as Moksha Purushartha. It is freedom from identifying, identifying ourselves with the body as me, Identi freedom from identifying the mind and the emotions as me. Can you imagine what a, what a beautiful life we will lead if we stop identifying the body and the mind as my real nature? Just imagine, even if you don't understand the uh, philosophy behind it, you can just imagine I am existing, I am conscious being. That is the truth. And that is the end of the truth. That is the reality. It is an error in my understanding that I am the body. It is an error in our understanding that I am the mind. Only when we are related to the body, we have roles to play. Identified with the body, I become the father, mother, daughter, son, brother, sister. Without this identification with the body, we don't have any roles to play. But we can still remain as an existent, conscious being. This is the beauty of all jnanis. They also live in the same world as us. We are jnanis, we identify with the body and we suffer. Veda never says don't identify with the body to play your roles. Veda says identify with the body, play your roles, as it comes to you by way of prarabdha karma. But Veda says, go one step forward, ask yourself, who am I? When you ask this question, who am I? Invariably, you have to come to the Veda Anta portion. And that is where Upanishadic study begins. 
That is where Bhagavad Gita study begins. So all of us who are in the who are in the path of spiritual study, we normally study Tattva Bodha, Atma Bodha initially taught by a teacher. These are preliminary texts. Why do we study this preliminary text? That is what I always recommend to new people who come and join the Vedanta students' website. I tell them, learn Tattva Bodha and Atma Bodha first. Understand the geography behind the entire spiritual study. And then study the Bhagavad Gita, Upanishads. Once you have studied Upanishads, you may have certain doubts. In the Upanishadic mantras, those doubts are clarified in Brahma Sutras. So, what is the five step study? Tattva Bodha, Atma Bodha, Bhagavad Gita, number three. Number four is Upanishadic study. Number five is Brahma Sutra. Very simple. It's a five step program. What will I get at the end of the fifth step, if you ask? Acharyas tell us, you will know your true nature. What is my true nature? I am a conscious being. That is my real self. It is always there. It is not identified with the body, but it exists. How, how, how do I experience this? Then the Acharya tells us, who are you in your sleep state? In the sleep state, I'm not identified with this body. I'm not identified with my mind. There are no emotions. There are no worries in the sleep state. The Acharya asks us, who are you in that state? Then the student understands, I am a conscious living, sentient being. I am not an inert object. The inert object does not know itself. There is no self-knowledge in a table or a chair. But a human being is self-conscious. That self-consciousness is the subject matter of all Vedantic study. This is how you should understand why am I studying the Upanishads. Many people just listen to Upanishadic one or two uh, lectures in the YouTube and then they get carried away and then they just jump from one, one, one topic to another topic without understanding the background of this whole spiritual science. The spiritual field is a scientific study. It's a step-by-step -step study of our real nature. There is no other science which can equal to this science because there's no comparison. All scientific study which we do in physics, chemistry, geography, IT, industry, anything is all objective science. There could be comparisons in objective science, but there is no comparison to subjective science. There is no other comparison. Who am I is a subjective science. The only place you can get the knowledge of the truth about ourselves is the Veda. There is no other literature in the universe which is equivalent to the Veda. And in the Veda, when I come into the Veda, then there are different portions in the Veda. The Acharya is required to tell me there is a, there is, there are two, there are two broad divisions in the Veda, Karma Kanda and Jnana Kanda. The Karma Kanda is, a pro, is, is followed for the purification of the human mind. It is related to the Jnana Kanda. Jnana Kanda is the final portion of the Veda which teaches me 
my real nature as a conscious being. There is an interlink between the two. Shankaracharya brilliantly comments on this sambandha relationship between karma kanda and jnana kanda in his favorite sambandha bhashyam which comes in the introduction of keno upanishad shankaracharya has written two commentaries that is why this commentary is very this upanishad some commentators say this is a very special upanishad there is no other Upanishad that Shankaracharya has written two commentaries. One is called Padabhashyam, another is called Vakya Bhashyam. With this small background, I will uh, get into the Shanti Mantra. Shanti Mantra is very famous in all the Upanishads. Each Upanishad has a Shanti Mantra. There are four Vedas, four uh, 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 Yajur Veda, Sama Veda, Rig Veda, uh, Atharva Veda. There are four, the Veda has been divided into four parts. In each of these parts, there are several Upanishads. When you study Sama Veda, which is what we are studying now, Keno Upanishad is a part of Sama Veda. Chandogya Upanishad is a part of Sama Veda. So as we study the different Upanishads, I will tell you which Veda it belongs to. Here, Shanti Mantra is a mantra asking, a student is asking four favors from the Lord. What are the four favors? Number one, Sharira Arogyam. Now, this is how Shankaracharya describes the Shanti Mantra. Four aspects to the Shanti Mantra. Number one, Sharira Arogyam. May my limbs be in perfect condition. My organs. Apyayantu mamangani vak prana chakshuhu. Shrotra. Let my organs of knowledge, organs of action, let them be fit. This is the first favor, a prayer to the Lord. Everything in, the, in this world is nothing but Brahman. Brahman means it is a substratum for the universe. Here it says, let me, let I never deny this Brahman. That means I have astitva buddhi. This is the second favor. Second favor is what? Astitva buddhi. Astitva buddhi means Brahman exists. Let me believe. Let me have shraddha. Let me have complete faith that there is something called as Brahman. That is the second favor asked by a student. The third favor is what? Let that Brahman never drop me. Let that, you see, I should have faith in the existence of Brahman and then what is the next, uh, 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 next prayer? Very beautiful Shanti Mantra, it says, Ishwara Anugraha. Let that Ishwara Anugraha, that blessing of that Brahman, Ishwara, let it come to me. 
That is the third prayer. And then the last part of the prayer is, let me have the virtues which will help me in my study, in my shravanam, mananam, nidityasana. Why do we need this shraddha, faith? Shraddha means faith. Faith in something which I don't see in front of my sense organs. Normally, if I see a cow in front of me, I say there is a cow in front of me, it exists. But then it, Brahman or the Lord, I can't see with my sense organs. The Upanishads are revealing to me something very unique. You must understand this right in the beginning of the study of the Upanishads. You are not going to have a new experience of anything. You are not going to see some light and say that is Brahman. No. Anything which is, which is, which is in front of the sense organs or in the mind is not, is not the subject matter of the Veda. The subject matter of the Veda is beyond the sense organs, beyond the mind. Therefore, when I study the Veda, the Veda says there is Brahman, there is something called as a Lord, which you can't see, but it is existing in the world. It is the substratum of the world. How my mind has to understand the Lord is our aim of Upanishadic study. When we go to pray in the temples, we see an idol, that is the step number one. It is a very preliminary step. But when we want to see that Lord in, my, in our own self, that is why we come to Upanishad. So faith is extremely important because Advaita Vedanta deals with Nirgunam Brahma. Nirgunam Brahma means there is no Guna attached to it. Therefore, the sense organs, it doesn't come in the purview of sense organs or the mind. Anything with gunas can be perceived by the sense organs. Guna means virtue, uh, uh, qualities, attributes. The Dvaita, Dvaita philosophers and the Visishta Dvaita philosophers, Nyaya, Sankhya, these are all logicians. They are also philosophers. Yoga, they are also philosophers. They don't believe in Nirguna Brahman. They all believe in Saguna Brahman. Saguna Brahman means what? Ishwara. They say there is an Ishwara which is with form. And that is the ultimate truth. So, Faith in the Veda is important and this faith is what I am praying for it at the beginning. See, the student of Vedanta is a very, very uh, disciplined student. He knows exactly what he is going to study. He knows why he is coming to the Veda. And he knows the benefit of this study. That is what is mentioned in this Shanti Mantra. The last portion, Om Shanti Shanti Shanti, is a, is a, is a prayer to ward off all obstacles which are coming from three angles. Adi Bhuta, Adi Daivika, and Adhyatmika. Obstacles which come from the Adi Bhutas are our neighborhoods. Adi Devika is the natural forces. Rain, for example, due to rain, you can't attend a class. That is natural, Adi Devika. So we pray to the Lord and say, please let me not have these obstacles. Shanti means peace from Adi Devika forces peace from Adhyatmika forces, 
Adhyatmika means what? It is obstacle coming from my own mind. Why should I go for the class today? Let me go to sleep. Let me enjoy something else. So those are all my own mind, which is giving obstacles. That is Adhyatmika. So when I don't have these three obstacles coming from the neighborhood, coming from the devatas, coming in internally from my own mind, I am at peace to study the Upanishads. See what a brilliant way the Upanishads begin. Very beautiful Shanti Mantra is very, very, uh, very profound in thoughts. Just to summarize, what is the Shanti Mantra? It is talking about Sharira, Arogyam, fitness of the, of the body and the organs. I pray to the Lord to keep my organs of action, organs of knowledge perfect so that I can pursue this study. Second benefit, second favor, Second prayer is Astitva Buddhi. Let me not, let me have Shraddha in the ultimate truth which is revealed by the Upanishads. And in one word, what is it? Brahman. There is Brahman in this universe. My sense organs cannot perceive it, mind cannot perceive it, but I have faith in the Upanishadic study. And I have the faith that this is the reality. This is a very important qualification of a student. Those who have studied Tathva Bodha can realize this. Because without this Shraddha, many people, they lose faith in the study itself. They give up the study. They do one Upanishad. They say, oh, no, no, no. These are all, you know, some, some big study. I don't, I don't believe in that. So they drop out. But a qualified student, if he knows right in the beginning, I am going to study something which is not seen, not heard, but it exists. Then you will pursue the study. The third, third aspect is Ishwara Anugraha, blessing from the Lord. The last one is, let me have virtues, Devi Sampat, so that I can get the benefit of this study. All the values which are described in the Gita, 13th chapter, 12th chapter, you should remember. And the last is three types of shantis, peace from all types of obstacles which can come in my study. With that, now let me go to the notes which I have prepared. <clears throat> Upanishadic are serious attempts to know the truth and experience the truth in oneself. And the Vedas are the sources. The Vedas are divided into mantra portion, Ramana portion, Aryan, Aryanka portion. What is the mantra portion? Mantra portion is the hymns in praise of the Vedic gods. What is the Brahmana portion? They prescribe the technique of search after the truth. How should I go after this reality? This Keno Upanishad is a part of Brahmana portion. It is a part of, it comes in the Brahmana, it is called as Talvakara Brahmana, which is what is mentioned in the uh, Shankaracharya's Bhashya. Talvakara Brahmana consists of nine chapters. And in first eight chapters, the Karmakanda portion is discussed. And the ninth chapter is this Upanishad. So Upanishad can come in either the Mantra portion, Brahmana portion, or Aryan, Aryanka portion. Keno Upanishad comes in the Brahmana portion. And it comes in the Talvakara. Brahmana, that is why this Kena Upanishad is also given another name, Talbakara Upanishad. 
Aryan ka portion, Aryan ka portion means generally people uh, look, uh, study this in the forest. And this is mostly to do with meditations and Nididhyasana uh, uh, portion, uh, which is more to do with one's own internal uh, reflections of the, of the reality. What is Keno Upanishad? Keno Upanishad is an inquiry into the nature of reality. See, what we are studying is, what is my nature? Nature is something which is always there. That is why we call it nature. And it is real. Real means what? It exists all the time. Body does not exist all the time. Body exists for a few years. What exists all the time? Consciousness. I am a conscious being. In the waking state, I am conscious. In the dream state, I am conscious. In the sleep state, I am conscious. In the waking state, I experience the physical body. In the dream state, I experience the subtle mind. In the sleep state, I don't experience the body or the mind, but I exist. That is how Upanishad reveal the reality. And Upanishads, they give a technique. That technique is called as Mahavakya. I'm going to talk about these Mahavakyam on Wednesday's sessions starting next week. This Mahavakya portion is the essence of the Upanishads. The 12 Upanishads, what is the essence of that? I'm going to start my talks on Wednesday, coming Wednesday. Even if you're attending these Upanishad classes and you don't have time to attend Wednesday sessions, just, be, just join the Wednesday class by just writing to us and get the class video, uh, audio, audio, audio portion, or you can see it in the YouTube also. And then you get the notes of those. I'm going to do Panchadasi chapter five, which is the essence of Mahavakyas. Very beautiful. I mean, I've never taken a, a session like this before. I hope I can, uh, uh, I can do justice to it, but this is the first time I'm taking it. Panchadasi chapter five deals with <coughs> Mahavakyas. Mahavakya, it, and it will talk about four Mahavakyas from four different Upanishads. Therefore, it's a unique talk, which I will be starting on this Wednesday. Those of you who can, please join. Coming back to this, what are the questions of a fully grown up soul? A mature human being, what are the questions he has in his mind? What are the questions? Where did I come from? Where do I go after these experiences of this world? Where do I go? Because I am not a permanent. And before the birth of this body, where, did, where was I? What, what was my nature? If these two questions are there, the third question is very natural. Why have I come into this world? What is the purpose of this, of this entry into this world? Then the next question is, is life a meaningless incident? Is it an accident? Has life a purpose? If so, what is the mission of life? If these questions are there about our own identity, then you are a fit student to study Keno Upanishad. Because when you study this Upanishad, the Upanishad will reveal the truth and you will be able to understand the truth. 
It's a short Upanishad. It is not a very long Upanishad, maybe in three, four months, uh, in about maybe 15, 20 sessions, I'll be able to finish this Upanishad. Even if you study this Upanishad, see what happens is, some people, they study one Upanishad, they realize that truth and then they are happy. Some people go to the next Upanishad. Some people go to the third Upanishad. So if your mind is ready, you will pick up this truth. Always have that confidence. Instead of lo looking outside externally to find the truth, Look inside, because the truth revealed is not outside you, but it is inside you. The halls of joy are not outside, but they are inside. Everyone's experience of the world is different. The joy, sorrows of each individual's being is very different. Only that particular individual will know. That means your joy is different than your father's joy, your daughter's joy. They have their own prarabdha, they have their own karmas, they have their own activities. They will, enjoy, they will go through that joy and sorrow for which they are born into this world. What, what happens to a jnani who has studied the Upanishad he remains unmoved, unagitated, and he is an ocean of peace. And he's always at rest, samadhanam. And he enjoys the atma sukha, the joy, the bliss born out of this knowledge of atma. There is a joy which will come to you when you study the Upanishads or the Bhagavad Gita. Many of you have enjoyed these talks for maybe seven, eight, ten years with me. I've been teaching for the last eight years. So you have, you have come again and again to come and experience the truth which is revealed by the Upanishads. Believe there is a, that truth is there. Believe there is, an, there is joy inside you, not outside in the world. Inside you means it has to be known. It is a knowledge born bliss. And what is the path? All the Upanishads, Bhagavad Gita talks about the same path, one single path. And what is the path? Renounce the ego that I am the body. Renounce the ego portion which, say, which makes you feel I am the mind. So the path is cognitively try to tell yourself I am not the body. The body is undergoing joy and sorrow. As per the prara, the karma, the mind is going through the emotions as directed by the prara, the karma. But the karma, the karma uh, column of the body or mind does not belong to me, the sakshi, the witness of the body. I am the witness, consciousness. Therefore, the Upanishad says, wake up, rise, awake to this truth. Stop not till this goal is reached. Swami Vivekananda's favorite uh, uh, statement. It comes from Katho Upanishad. In us, there are two personalities. What are the two personalities? Godhood and manhood. What is the Godhood, the nature of Godhood in me? In, it is not outside. It is in me only. It is in this body only. That Godhood is a witness. It is a conscious principle. Immortal principle. Always there. Body may not be there. Like in the slave state, body I don't experience, but I am there. And what is that experience in my sleep state? I am limitless because there is no time, there is no space. It is when time and space are gone, I feel limited. 
when there is no time and space, I am not limited. I don't feel any limit, limitations in my sleep state, but I exist as conscious being. So that is called as the God within me. That consciousness is given the name God to, for me to relate to that conscious, consciousness because I can't see it. But I, the Upanishads, the Veda tells me that is the reality. What is manhood? What are the experiences? Why, what, what, what are the two different experiences? One I am telling you is the immortal nature. What is the mortal nature of all human beings? Limitations, birth, death, ego-driven life. Ego-driven life means what? I get up in the morning, I start becoming a karta and a bhokta. That's all. Whole day I am doing either actions and then I get rewards of those actions. I earn money, I, I do so many different actions. I get married, I get children, I get... I earn money, I earn, I build houses, I, I build so many things. It's all this is, comes down to one basic, two things which are there. The, all the activities are broken up into only two. Either I am a karta, the doer, or I am a bhokta. Bhokta means I am an enjoyer of the results of actions. What Upanishad tells is, you detach from this ego, the I, which is a karta and a bhokta. This ka, detach means what? Not physically, not, uh, not, you can't do it. Because that is prarabdha karma. It is driven by prarabdha. In your mind, you tell yourself, I am not this karta and bhokta. I am the sakshi, which is revealed by Keno Upanishad. Those who have done Munda Kopanishad will understand this very easily. But even if you are a beginner, you will be able to pick up this knowledge because it is complete by itself. Ego is the enemy. Let me spy on that ego. And what is the meaning of the ego? Ego is my mind. Constantly, morning to evening, it is, it, it is the voice inside me. Do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this. Go after this, don't go after this. Attachment, detachment, attachment, detachment. Whole day, whole life, whole week, whole month, whole year passes with this attachment to the ego. Shivaratri means what? I detach from this ego and I attach to the Shivam in me, the auspicious in me. That nature, that Lord who is in this body as the consciousness principle, that is what is the real meaning of Shivratri. I detach from the ego, Ahamkara, and I attach to the higher principle in the same body. I chant the Japa of Shiva, I pray to Lord Shiva to make me detach from the ahamkara mind and come and attach to the Shiva in me, the auspicious in me. This ego is what? It is a totality of all the memories, the experiences of the past. Do I remember all my childhood experiences, youthful experiences? That is what is called as ego. Whenever you have memories in your mind, it is nothing but ego. It is anxiety for the future, hopes for the future. Will I, will I have a good life after 10 years when I retire? Will my children be happy? These are all anxieties of the future. Again, this is the ahamkar. So the past troubles us with memories. The future troubles us with the anxieties. But what is the reality? Reality is the past is dead. The future is unborn. 
It has no existence in the present. But I spend more all my life either with the past or with the future. Upanishad tells me, live in the present. Live in the reality of the present conscious being. Then you are always attached to the reality, the truth. Whenever the mind goes to the past, after the study of this type of Upanishads, remind yourself, let me forget the past because it is a dead past, gone. When I study the Upanishad, Upanishad teaches me, forget the past, the anxieties of the future. They may come, they may not come. So what do I do? I live in the present all the time, right now, living in the now. Right now, what can I do? Right now, can I study? Right now, can I have a, a happy life? A man, a jnani, is one who leads every moment of his life happily. You and I can also lead. The truth is, we are born to be happy not born to be sad or have an anxious life. Upanishad teaches us this. Step by step, this Upanishad will teach us, follow these mantras in this Upanishad. At the end of the Upanishad, you we can have a discussion. Is this the truth or is it something which is beyond my mind? So the the tyrant in this within us is the mind. The mind is the enemy, the mind is a friend. When I control this mind, then Ramayana will shine in my bosom. Rama will be in my heart. Every spiritual practice, whether it is Japa, whether it is uh, whether it is Parayanam, whether it is visit to a temple, it is for the elimination of this shadow called as Aham Kara or the mind within us. Remember this sentence, very, very important. Whatever I do in the way of spiritual practice, what is the goal of that? Whether I do production in the temple, I want to get rid of this aham, aham kara, the mind. And I want to remain with sakshi, which is also in this same mind. It is within me. In this body, there is a sakshi. In this body, there is a reality. In this whole universe, there is a reality. The reality behind the universe, the reality in me is the same. That is the essence of Mahavakyam. In this Upanishad also, it will teach us this Sakshi is not an object. It is, uh, it is a subject. The mind has no... Con you, you cannot objectify it and put it in front of your mind or in front of your sense organs. It is not possible. Vedanta teaches us the unreality of the non-existent world. The world is there, but it is of a lower order of reality. What is the truth? The truth is I am, I the conscious being, am the higher order of reality. When I am seated in the higher order of reality and I look at the world outside, whether it is my body, whether it is my mind, or whether it is the world around me, it is mithya. Mithya means it is there for experience, but it is fleeting, like the dream. Where is a dream of yesterday? Gone. This waking dream will be gone tomorrow. So why are you focused and sorrowful? Situations will come and go, but let it pass, let it pass, let it pass. Let, it, let me come back to my... Fulcrum. Let me come back to my core of the personality, which is Atma. 
by superimposition the unreal wields the real unreal world affects me because i superimpose the world i superimpose the body as me body is born i say i am born this is an error if you don't know the process of understanding this truth you will also say that you know this may not be true you will also feel that but the but the upanishad will teach you that process will tell you how to look at your self adhyasa bhashyam of shankaracharya is very famous i have taken a few classes on that and if you follow the adhyasa bhashyam very important to know that there is something called as super superimposition of the unreal on the real i am short i am tall i am happy i am sad these are all superimpositions thoughts will come in the mind i am unhappy today i am angry today i was angry yesterday these are all superimpositions on what on the pure being the pure being is a conscious being it can never be attached to the anatma anatma means what body mind sense organs world atma means what my core self upanishad teaches me atma is asangaha it is never attached but you are making an error that i am that i am the body i am born i am the body i am i have got diseases if i am not the body you can you will say what will you what will you realize the body has got a disease it will it will has a problem it will it will go away after some time mind is angry mind was angry yesterday it was angry for two months after a lot of difficulty i forgot about that it went away mind it is not me that is what keno upanishad will teach you the very first verse of the keno upanishad is a realization verse mahavakya first verse you will see when we speak up the uh, verse you will see and i will make you convinced that that is a mahavakya so this type of superimposition like the serpent on a rope the rope you see in the evening time and um, you uh, and then you uh, you think it is a you think it is a snake that is what is called as superimposition so on waking up you see this body and you think i am the body but then you must ask the question who am i in my sleep in my dream state this body is not there therefore what therefore i must not take this body as 100% real there is a reality which is beyond the body and that is the conscious being then this ignorance about atma is gone then that reality shines not outside but the reality shines in me i come to know i am the consciousness i didn't know this till now but when i studied the keno upanishad i got that benefit and i can remain peaceful every time i become sorrowful i again remember this truth keno upanishad says i am atma behind the body behind the mind behind the sense organs that atma is always asangaha it is a reality it is never connected with the body but in its presence the whole drama of the body mind world goes on shankaracharya beautifully presents this in his bhashya very very beautiful all sadhanas are for eliminating this ego i 
I am not a sa I am a sadhaka till I get the knowledge. But what does the knowledge tell me? You are not the sadhaka, you are not the sadhyam. There is sadhaka and sadhyam is in the time space world. There is the reality which is beyond time and space, which the science can never enter. That is why you have to come to the Veda. You have to come to the Upanishad, Mundaka Upanishad, Keno Upanishad, Taitri Upanishad, Mandukya Upanishad. If you study four or five Upanishads, your mind will absorb the truth in a step-by-step -step fashion. It is a knowledge. Step by step, like how you do kindergarten, come to the primary, get, go to the secondary, go to college, and then go to get into a master's degree program and then a PhD. The PhD is a Mahavakya, which will tell you the truth. This is the truth from the Veda. Now, the Veda will tell you, if you're interested, realize the truth and be free. That is moksha. When we act without expectations of the fruits of actions, it is called as karma yoga. Chapter 3, 4, 5 of Bhagavad Gita. This is summarized here. What is karma yoga? Ishvara arpana bhavana prasada bhutti. Whatever I do, it is for the for for the sake of the Lord. The sense that it is not for me. I don't want anything in the world. Let Lord decide and give me the fruit. Everything which you do, don't be hypnotized by your own expectations. Don't waste your time worrying about the unborn future. Act on. Go on acting in the living. Go on living in the present. I am living human being. Nobody can stop action. But if you know the truth, I am a conscious being. I am a conscious being. I am a Sakshi. I am a Sakshi. I am a Sakshi. That is the end conclusion of the Vedantic study. I am not affected by the body. Will act. I will see that the body is acting. Nobody can stop the body from acting. Bhagavad Gita says this. Action is ours, fruits are given by the Lord as per the prarabdha karma. That's all. You surrender your will, you live as his instrument. Nimitta karam. Bhagavad Gita tells you that you are an instrument of some higher principle which is called as consciousness. You are only, you means what? The body and the mind. It is only an instrument. It is coming and going. In waking state, it goes off. In, in waking state, it comes, and then in sleep state, it goes again. Again, it comes next day, again, it goes again. What the Lord says is, just become aware of this principle. In consciousness, waking, sleep, and uh, dream comes and goes. You are that consciousness. You are that substratum. This is the methodology of the study. When you fall flat to this consciousness, this, this ahamkara, the mind which is the shadow, it will no longer disturb you. Because you are always free from the pangs of the mind. I have to do that. I have to do that. I have to enjoy that. I have to, I have to do that tomorrow. The mind will still be acting in the world, but you get a new strength from the study of openness. Nobody will get it just like that. It is through the study because the Veda is the Pramana. You stop dreaming, look within when you look within what happens, that is what is called as upasana. 
So karma yoga, upasana yoga are angas. They are the steps. They are the stepping stones. I am rich, I am mortal, I am wise, I am a samsarin. These are all thoughts in my mind. You cleanse your bosom with all the desires, detach the ego, detach the mind from the memories and hopes and anxieties. Then you build up a relationship with the spirit in you, the sakshi in you, the absolute spirit. What is that absolute spirit? Hanuman, Hanuman says in the in the uh, one of the Upanishads, this, this statement comes from Hanuman. Hanuman says, I am your slave, O Lord. I am a part of you, O Lord. I am thyself. I am yourself. He tells to Rama. When Rama asks Hanumanji, he says, I am your slave. When, am I, when I am your slave, when I'm identified with the body. That is what Madhavacharya takes it up as his truth. That is called dualism principle. The world is real. I am real. World and I are two different. And it is dualistic. Dvaitam. So when a person feels that I am different and, uh, uh, and the world is different, it is Dvaitam. So in the world when we are living, it is always Dvaita. Our waking state is always in Dvaita. When I'm identifying with the mind, okay, physical body is a gross body. Subtle body is the mind. This mind belongs to Hiranyagarbha. It is a part of Hiranyagarbha, which is the cosmic mind. There is a cosmic mind. Total mind. Like I have a mind, in the whole universe, there is Hiranyagarbha. The first born in the universe is Brahmaji or Hiranyagarbha. Hiranyagarbha means what? It is the total cosmic mind. This mind is related to that cosmic mind. It will wake up when that cosmic mind wakes it up. That is, that is why there is a link of the outside world and the inside mind. Who controls my waking and dream and sleep? Ask this question to yourself. You will come to the conclusion there is a cosmic mind. There is a total mind. And that Keno Upanishad teaches me. Hanumanji knows this. So he told Rama that when I, this is this, this statement which I am making is from an Upanishad. where Lord Hanuman got realization. There is an Upanishad which, in which Lord Hanuman gets realization from Lord Rama. So when I'm identifying the mind, it is called as Visishta Advaita. Visishta means what? I am a part of the universe. I am a part of the Lord. So when you become... See, when you study the Upanishad, what happens is you suddenly discover the nature of your mind. You discover there is a creative mental shakti in me, mental power in me. That is the benefit of the study of the Upanishad. You, you will come to discover this. This is the second portion of your second stepping stone in the spiritual journey. And what is the ultimate spiritual journey? Hanumanji says, I am you. When I identified the, with the spirit in me, which is what Shankaracharya teaches in all the Upanishads, Shankaracharya says, Upanishads are teaching us not Dvaitam, not duality, not Visishta Advaitam, attributed reality, but it is talking about non-dual nature, which is Advaita. 
Wenn wir Jani Kreis in Shivaratri, Shivoham, 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 what does he mean by that? I am that truth which the Lord is teaching in the Upanishads. Today being the Mahashivratri day and we are starting this Kevno Upanishad, it's a very, it's a blessing for us. At the end of the Kevno Upanishad, I'm, I'm sure all of us will realize that Lord in us, the individual I, which is that mind with the Chidabhasa, mind with the reflection of that consciousness, which is the Ahamkara, cries out and says, Shivoham, I am that auspicious Shivaha, that Nirguna Tattvam, I am, I am, I am. That is the Mahavakya. That is the realization of every seeker. You and I can realize this when we study this Upanishad. The source of all life is this aham, which is in us, which is the atma in us. We go through different stages in our journey of self-discovery. And ultimately realize the fundamental substratum of the whole universe which is called as Brahman. Brahman is a technical word used in the Upanishads. You must understand the clear meaning of Brahman, which we will study. When we take up the Upanishad study, we'll, see, we'll check what it is. If you have doubts, I will clarify it. There will be no problems. It's a very, if you are at it continuously, reading the notes, listening to the talks without interruptions, you will realize the truth. What are the sadhana chatushtayam? Sadhana chatushtayam means four qualifications of a student. Viveka, Vairagya, Umakshutvam, Samadha, Shadka, Sampati. In every Upanishadic talk, at the beginning, an Acharya will say, what are the qualifications you should possess to understand the Upanishad? We have studied this in the Tathogoda. I will just give you a brief description of this so that you can remind yourself. Viveka means your mind should be able to discriminate what is permanent in this world, which is consciousness, and what is unreal or just an appearance, which is the body and mind in the waking state, which is called as mithya. It is a shadow. It is only name and form. This discrimination between the reality and the unreal between the truth, which is called as Atma or Brahman, and the unreal, which is called as Anatma, that is the first qualification. Viveka Buddhi. Vairagya. Vairagya means what? It is the power which you possess out of this Viveka to drop the Anatma and hold on to Atma. That is called as dispassion. The first one is discrimination. Dispassion is the second. Mumukshutva is a power to desire. To desire that truth. I have that power. Icha Shakti. Without the five sense organs experiencing the five sense objects, there is something which is the substratum. I should know that substratum, that is what is called as mumukshutva. I have a keen desire. All of you have this desire. That's why you have come to the study of Vedanta. You have come to the study of Upanishad because you are interested in knowing the truth. 
That is the third D. Discrimination, dispassion, desire. The last one is called as discipline. Samadhas, samadhi shatka sampati. What is this? The sixfold qualifications of sama, dama, uparama, titiksha, samadhana, shardha. Sama means control of the mind. Dama means control of the sense organs. Uparama means um, ability to uh, remain in the control fashion, continue in the con control. Uparama means con stability. Titiksha means forbearance. Whatever you may get problems in life, for bear it, bear it. You know, bearing, bearing that, that's called as fortitude. Samadhanam means equipoise of the mind, always remaining balanced. Shraddha means faith. These are all the six qualifications. The details you will find it in Tattva Bodha. And how do I do this inquiry after gaining these qualifications? I should look at the world in threefold ways. Number one, the gross world. Where is this gross world coming from? Where does it manifest from? Where does this go into unmanifest? Where does it come from? Where does it go? World, huh? that is the gross world of physical, of body, physical world. Panchabhutas. The Tamoguna aspect of pancha, uh, pancha uh, bhau, uh, bhutas, they create the physical world and the body. They are all inert in nature. They are not sentient by themselves. Then the subtle world. Subtle world is the indriyams, the, the sense. The, the sense organs. The power behind the sense organs, the power behind the eyes, the power behind the ears, that power, where is it coming from? Where is it going? How does the mind work? The, the reality of the universe is discovered when you discover the reality of your mind. I repeat again, the reality of this whole universe is discovered when you discover the reality of your own mind. The mind comes into manifest condition and the mind goes into unmanifest condition. It manifests in the waking state, it unmanifests in the sleep state. The world also manifests in this waking state and the world also unmanifest in the sleep state. When you understand your mind, you will understand the world. When you understand the world and the mind, you will then bubble inside with the joy of Atma, which is the substratum, the inner spirit, which is the cause of this entire manifestation and manifestation. I am ignorant of the waking world in my sleep state. I am ignorant of my spiritual nature in my sleep state. When this ignorance goes away through the Atma Jnanam, my Ignorance, which has been continuously there in several births, which is called as Mula Avidya, it goes away. When that Mula Avidya goes away through the study of the Upanishads and the Mahavakyam, you will be free, which is called as Moksha, which is the final benefit of any study of the Bhagavad Gita, the Upanishad, or Brahma Sutra. So once again, what is the final goal for me? 
to understand that I am a conscious being, which is a substratum for the manifestation of the mind and the world. It is a substratum for the unmanifestation of the world and the mind. When I know this knowledge, I am the reality behind the whole universe. I am that Brahman. That reality is called as Brahman. And that is Nirguna. Nirguna means I, my mind cannot know it. I will only know it through the study of Upanishads. Keno Upanishad beautifully reveals this nature in the very first mantra of the Upanishad. In Taitri Upanishad, the same truth is discovered through the five koshas. Annamaya kosha is the body, physical sheet. Pranamaya kosha is the vital air sheet. Manomaya kosha is the mind, the sheet covering the atma. Vijnanamaya kosha is the intellectual sheet. Anandamaya kosha is the bliss sheet which covers the reflected joy in the sleep state. And all the joys which I experience in the world are all anandamaya kosha. It is an abhasa. It is a reflection. It is not real. But it is a supplant, subtlest. And I, I, I attach to that as reality, then I suffer. Beyond these five koshas, is Atma. That is the reality which Kena Upanishad tells me. Tattva Bodha tells me that is the reality behind the five koshas. World has existence in ourselves. We have full freedom and thraldom of all sorrows, disappointments, failures. We have, we have freedom from them. How? By the study of Upanishads and realizing that I am the immortal Atma behind this body, which is one with the substratum of the whole universe. That is the Mahavakya, the connection between me, the individual, and the totality is made through that Mahavakyam, Tattvamasi. When I analyze, analyze the Jiva, Jagat, and Ishvara, the total causal body, the total subtle body, and the total gross body, then I can understand the relationship, the Sambhandava between me and the world. The truth is like Akasha. What is the comparison between Akasha, the space, and the truth? Both are all pervasive. Pervasive. Pervasive space is all pervasive. This consciousness is also all pervasive. The space is unconnected with everything which it holds. This consciousness is unconnected with all the minds, all the bodies which it holds. It is never sullied. It is never. It has never become dirty. It doesn't. It doesn't become affected. Similarly, space also never affected. Space is always space. It can never. If you have a, 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 a odor, it will never uh, affect the space. So the relationship between Jiva, Jagat, Ishwara and the reality is explained through an example of threads in a cloth and patterns in a cloth. The patterns in the cloth are the pictures, like a painting. You can draw anything in the in the in the in the in a, in a painting. Similarly, the patterns in a cloth. What is the thread? What is the substratum of those patterns? It is a thread. The thread is nothing but the consciousness principle, the existence principle. 
It is that principle the Kano Upanishad wants to reveal. The Taitri Upanishad says it is Satchit Ananda. That is the thread. It is the eye in this body, which is always there. Whether you are in sleep, whether you are in dream, whether you are in me, that I will never leave us. That is what we all experience in our, in our uh, life. There is something which is continuously there. Aham, 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 aham. It never goes. Yesterday you are conscious, you are existing principle. Today you are conscious that knowing principle in me is that aham. What is ahamkara? Ahamkara is born and gone. Born in the waking state, gone in the sleep state. Again, born in the waking state, gone in the sleep state. Born after the, in the next body, gone after the next body. Continuously born and gone, born and gone, born and gone. But what is what the consciousness I, aham, always said? That I is revealed in Keno. So you have to differentiate between ahamkara, I, and sakshi, I. And what is veiling this truth? It is the maya shakti, which is responsible for our waking state, dream state, sleep state. Continuously, it's coming and going. Continuously, it's coming and going. For all of us, it is you for, it's common to maya shakti, it's common to all of us. That is the Ishwara shakti. See, Ishwara Srishti and Jiva Srishti, which is what I discussed in my previous Panchadasi chapter 4 in Wednesday sessions. Those who are attending both the sessions, Wednesday and Saturday, you will understand that. So, coming back to this nature of the truth, it is covered. Why I don't realize it? I, I, if, the, if the truth is there, I should know it. If I, I should, all of us should know I am a conscious being. Why I feel I am not a, I feel I am a body and I feel I am, I have, I am, I am this mind because of this Maya. More about this Maya I am going to cover next week in the next session. I will start with this law of karma because it's a slightly long topic and I will continue this. What I will do is I will um, send you the notes of this today after the class. I don't, I, or you might have received it today uh, in, the, in the WhatsApp. You will also get in the email if you have requested for it. So we'll continue the Kano Punishan in the next session. I will stop here for any QA um, or any other general points about these sessions. Kena Upanishad is a very beautiful Upanishad, and it's a it's a it's a it's a short and a brilliant Upanishad because it reveals the truth immediately, exactly like Mandukya Upanishad. Mandukya Upanishad in twelve mantras, the whole truth is given. For Brahmanic Upanishad, Chandogya Upanishad, you have to study chapters and chapters and chapters, very long. But Mandukya Upanishad and Keno Upanishad are the king of the Upanishads. They will reveal the truth in a subtle way, but you have to pick it up. Your mind has to be ready. How does the mind become ready? By developing the four Ds. Constantly practice. If you don't know, if you have not done Tathobodha, go back and do Tathobodha. Do Atma Buddha. In your time, in your free time. Continue this Upanishadic study, you will realize what is expected in the Upanishads. With this, I close today's session. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnahat Purnamudachade Purnasya Purnamathaya Purnameva Vasishade Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Sri Guru Pyon Mahan Hari Om So if you have any questions you are free to ask now
I'll go through the chat portion. Uh, there's one question Manikandan is asking. Who controls the mind? Is mind the controller of the mind or Pradartham or Ishvara is the controller of the mind? A uh, very good question. Uh, you will get the answer to this question when we do the first verse of the Upanishad. That is the question. Your question is being asked by the student of Keno Upanishad right in the beginning. You are a good student. You are asking the first question of the Upanishad itself. To, put you, put, to give you a brief answer, see, the mind is born because of Prarabdha Karma. You should understand that very clearly. Uh, can you please send the okay, uh, 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 notes of the previous session? This is the first session of Kena Upanishad. There is no previous session. You will get the notes uh, of this session. If you have not got it, you will get it tomorrow. I will ask uh, uh, Shanmugam, my assistant, to send you the notes. Uh, this whole notes of Kena Upanishad, you will get it. So who controls the mind? The Lord controls the mind. That is why he is called as Karma Thala Atha. What are the experiences which I undergo every day? It is controlled by the mind. The mind is projecting thoughts. Through those thoughts, I experience the world. Very simple. This body has got a mind. This mind is controlled by the Lord, Antaratma. Who is the controller of the mind? Bhagavad Gita, 18th chapter, 61st verse. I am the controller of all the minds in the universe. That's what Lord Krishna says in the 18th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. So, the Lord is the controller. He is a karma phala data. That means, I undergo experiences morning, afternoon, evening, I become, I, the body is undergoing. That is a law of the world, see? Like how the sun goes around the, around the, uh, it's how the sun is the center of the universe, the earth goes round and round the sun. It is law. It is a principle of the universe. See, the Ishvara, the Lord, controls the whole universe through devatas. The devatas are nothing but, they are the controllers of all the elemental forces. The gravitational force, the, the magnetic force. Similarly, there is a force which controls our minds. That controller of the mind is called as Hiranyagarbha. Who is that is why we pray to the Sun Lord. Sun Lord is what? Surya Devata is the power. It is the power of that Hiranyagarbha. Hargodevasya Dimahi Diyoyona Prachodhyat. So we pray to that Lord who, who controls this mind. To con so to answer your question in brief, it is Ishwara who controls through the prarabdham of the jiva. It is not that the Ishwara is giving us, uh, at, at, you know, for you it is a good prarabdha, for me, it is not Ishwara who decides. It is the jiva's karma which decides what type of mind and its experience uh, it will undergo. So ultimately, who, 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 is, who, is, who, is the, uh, who is behind this mind? It is the karma of the jiva. As per the karma of the jiva, you will have good experiences, good, uh, good projections, good uh, benefits, or you will have a mixture. You see, all human beings have a mixture of joy and sorrow. It is not all good, and it is not all bad. Each one of us will remember, Life is a mixture of good and bad experiences, joyful and sorrowful experiences. Okay, um, 
then there is how to always stay away uh, uh, aware of my stay aware of my true nature ah this is also be taught during the keno upanishad we will be doing some uh, we'll be doing some study like this see what how to be how to be aware of my nature always it's a very beautiful question um the only way the upanishad teaches me to be aware of myself is to remember the truth again and again if i remember the truth if i reflect on the truth see there are three methods the upanishad tells me shravanam mananam nidhyasnam repeated shravanam repeated mananam reflection repeated nidhyasnam will help me to remember my nature that is why we say listen to the shastra again and again even if you have done keno upanishad before listen again it will help you listen again again and again see suddenly you will find some things will click you in today's talk also you would suddenly find i am able to understand this so beautifully you will get that feeling so remembering means what always be attached to the shastra sometimes we tend to forget our nature yes you see whenever we are when we are whenever we are involved with the world in our daily transactions suppose i want to take care of my child he is not well i will forget the truth i will just be absorbed in taking care of the child or my mother or father or taking care of any situation so don't worry if you are involved in the world it is a nature of the body and mind to get involved absorbed in the world but who will remember that i am of the sachidananda nature i am the truth i am the sakshi if you are attached to the upanishadic talks it gets into subconscious mind then the truth goes into your subconscious mind when you wake up in the morning you will remember the pratasmarami shlokam i am the thuriya atma that is what will happen to you when the truth goes into the subconscious mind all of you are listening to the talk now this is conscious mind but it may have a tendency to forget suppose one or two of you remember ah i am not the mind i am the sakshi i am the witness i am the consciousness just one line you have picked up from this talk just remember it you reflect on it again tomorrow again next week you will come for a session again you will be told the same truth every session we are talking of the same atma again you listen again after during some between the seven next seven days if you remember one or two times it will go into your subconscious so this way what happens is it becomes a vasana in you see today the world is a vasana it is a Uh, it is a va the vasna in the mind it is the uh, it is the impressions of the world gathered from so many births now those impressions have to be deleted and the new atma vasana has to come in so what happens when you do this study atma vasana will increase and the vasanas of the world and the body mind uh, experiences will get reduced this process is called as the spiritual study process when you study when your study becomes stronger and stronger your mind will you will find that i am i am i am very powerful my mind is become very strong what what how do you express that how do you how will you experience that i can withstand anything in the world that is what your realization will be why because you are the atma you will forget that i am the body and mind yeah yeah body will undergo something some experiences will come and go anger will come and go joy will come and go 
this, uh, you know, uh, delusion will come and go in the mind. But I am not bothered because it is not me. That is a realization. That is what is the strength of the Upanishadic study. Your strong mind will develop. Guaranteed. This is guaranteed by the Upanishads, not me. It is the Upanishad tells this. The mind is the enemy, the mind is the friend of all human beings. When you know the truth, the mind is a friend. When you forget the truth, you are an agnani, you your mind becomes an enemy and your mind will give you all types of delusions. I'm suffering, I had this experience and you know, again and again, the mind goes on worrying about so, so many small, small things. Okay, thank you. And I think there are, uh, is this the same Hiranyagarbha through which the yoga was originated? Yes, you are right. Hiranyagarbha principle is the first mind. And it is the cosmic mind. It was created from Ishvara. Okay, uh, I've answered all the questions. Uh, in case you have, you can ask. I'll ask uh, Shanmugam to unmute everybody. So you can unmute yourself and ask a question if you have anything. Shankarji, you have come here. Ah, I came back on Saturday, boy. Uh, I mean, two days ago. That's why I was surprised. Huh? I was ah. checking every day, every week, but today uh, I noticed uh, half an hour that you were to start the class. Okay, anyway, uh, you, you're here. I'm very happy. Yeah, anybody else has a question? Sandeep Shekhar Ji. Ah, Bode. I'm Bode. Yeah, yeah. We are very happy to get you back. <laughs> yes, thank you. We miss you a lot. No problem. You you have the classes now, so yes. please please enjoy the classes. <coughs> Just be prepared. Yeah, you you will really enjoy this Kino Upanishad because it's very very beautiful uh, text. Sure, sure. That is what we are looking for. Yeah, hello, hello, ah, Ajita. Yeah. Yeah, wonderful class. But uh, I want to hear again. You, you will share the no uh, notes and everything, yeah? Yeah, yeah. I will share the notes and you will also get the today's uh, recording. You will get in the WhatsApp. In the WhatsApp, yeah. Yeah, yeah but, in, but with this, it is mind uh, touching and mind touching <laughs> today's class. Yes. Uh, <laughs> you see, every introduction of Upanishad is always a very beautiful uh, introduction. It, there was no preparation from my side. It just came in as I, I started the class. Yes, yes. Because I have already gone through Tattva Bodha, Atma Bodha. Hence, I was, feeling, I was feeling that, uh, yeah, yeah, that which is uh, touching our hand, which is go directly to our mind. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Anyway, uh, I will go through that again. Then, I, yes, I should. I have doubts arising yeah, in my yeah, mind. Yeah. Please, please write your questions when you come uh, to the next class. In the next yeah. Q and A session, you can ask the questions. Yes, of course. Thank you. Adio. Adio. Thank you. Thank you. Sagarji, I have one question. Ah, bolo. Yes, Manjana. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Sagarji. Actually, just a very preliminary question. What is the meaning of Keno? Uh, Kena means what? It is the, oh, okay. Good is question. Any... Yeah, K, K, Kena Upanishad, it is given Kena Upanishad title because the first word of the Upanishad is Kene Shitam. Kene Shitam, it starts with the word Kena. Kena means from where? From where is this life coming? From where is this body coming? From where is this mind coming? From where is this world coming? What is the impelling force for the world, for the sense organs, for the mind? From where is from where am I getting? What is the force by which I am experiencing my thoughts? Keneshitam. So Kena is the first word of the Upanishad. That is why you get this uh, word, uh, the, the, you, you get the name of the Upanishad is Kena Upanishad. 
This Upanishad is also called as Talvakara Upanishad. When you, when you hear the Shankara Bhashyam, in Shankaracharya's Bhashyam of this universe, of this uh, Upanishad, he tells that there are two names to this Upanishad. One name is Kena Upanishad. Another name is Talvakara Upanishad. Talvakara is a Rishi. The name of a Rishi is always attached to the Upanishad. So Talvakara Upanishad means it is the Rishi who had this, this, uh, 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 this Upanishad came to his mind when he was meditating. So, Kena is basically very popularly, it is called as Kena, basically it starts with the word Kena. Thank you, thank you. Sir. You're clear now, right? Yes, thank you. Okay, anybody else? Hiranyagarbha, I will talk about this Hiranyagarbha principle most probably in my Mandukya lecture. See, the Hiranyagarbha, uh, it comes in Mandukya Upanishad. It's a principle. It's a cosmic principle. Um, see, the Lord in, uh, in Upanishad, the Lord uh, created the world. He had a desire. The Lord remained without the world in the beginning. When the Lord had a desire, the first thing which was born was the mind. And that mind is called as cosmic mind. See, all of us, whenever we act in the world, our creativity, all our actions are preceded by thought in the mind. So similarly, the Lord, his thought thinking process, his thinking process is the cosmic mind. So it is a totality of all the minds, Hiranyagarbha or Brahmaji. It is the first born uh, being in the universe. When that Hiranyagarbha principle it is, a, it is a seat of all the minds. All the jivas are basically the minds. We all exist. Suppose you become free and you have realized yourself. What, according, to, uh, according, to the, uh, according to the scriptures, suppose your mula avidya goes away, your ignorance goes away, who are you becomes clear to you. Then what happens is you are one with the Hiranyagarbha principle and this Hiranyagarbha principle changes every Srishti, which is millions of years. So basically what happens is when you get the knowledge, I am not the human being which is born and gone, which is taking the mind to be real. When I move away and I realize Atma is the truth, the substratum, then this Mula Vidya goes away. When this Mula Vidya goes away, what happens? This, our mind merges with the total mind. I mean, I'm just giving you a very small, uh, small portion of what is there about the Serena Garba uh, principle, but more you will we'll discuss it as we study the Upanishads. Okay. Um, so we will uh, meet next week uh, and then we'll continue this uh, talk and you will see the notes. Uh, from time to time, I will also touch upon some aspects of uh, Keno Upanishad, which uh, Shankaracharya uh, describes in, the, in his Bhashyam. They are not part of the notes, but uh, I will, I will talk about it in my in my in my sessions because i'm studying the kena bhashyam right now so as and when i get some new aspects of the bhashyam which i want to share i will share it with you because they are see the bhashyam study is a very intense study very very intense study it is uh, once you have done this study then you can always go into the bhashyam study also but it takes a long time see kena bhashyam is it will take you 
one full year to, uh, to learn the Bhashya. Okay, let's uh, close today session and then we'll see you next week. Thank you. Good night. Okay. Good night. Good night. Good night. See you next week. Okay.